there's a uh, an alligator lizard here. This lizard that we have here is commonly known as the Madrian alligator lizard, and it's the only species of alligator lizard that lives in Arizona. It's also divided into three subspecies, and the one that we have here is called Elgaria kingi nobilis, and that particular subspecies has the common name Arizona alligator lizard. This is a lizard that's only found in two of the states, of course one of them being in Arizona, where we are right now, and the other one unsurprisingly is New Mexico but its distribution in that state is much smaller than in our state. The vast majority of this species range is found in Mexico. This species almost exclusively inhabits forests that are found at moderate to high elevations, which means that it can be found anywhere from mixed mesquite and oak, all the way to juniper, and eventually in pine forests, like on the peaks of the Sky Islands. More so than your average lizard, these use autotomy as a first defense against predators, and what that means is they purposely detach their tail from their body. The one that we have found has never dropped its tail, but if you're wondering what that looks like, here is a Madrian alligator lizard that dropped its tail some time ago. And the section of the tail where it can split off is not just limited to one point. It can split off at many different lengths, and this is often dictated by where it was grabbed by a predator, because the lizard wants to keep as much of its tail as possible. One advantage of selectively splitting the tail at a point that is closer to the tip is that a tail split can actually be used more than once if the original tail is preserved. I think we can let this one go now. Today we are in the mountains of southern Arizona. It is mid-November and we are looking for the Madera Canyon tarantula, also sometimes referred to as the Madera red rump tarantula. And this habitat that we're in right now is pretty much as auspicious as it gets, but we're not going to look for burrows We'll be finding these under rocks today. That being said, however, if I do come across what I suspect to be burrows, I will show you any that I might find. Oh, nice. We have our first tarantula in here. Before taking a closer look at this tarantula, I want you to look at this burrow. This is what we refer to as a scrape, or basically when a tarantula uses a rock as its overhead surface to build a burrow underneath. And very frequently, like this one, there's not really an obvious exit. So here you can see that sort of blocked exit. There's also two ends of this burrow where the tarantula may have blocked some parts off or is still currently working on digging that out. And yeah, there's this kind of middle island that the tarantula has built this burrow around. This tarantula that we have here, Phonopelma madera, is one that is found in a few mountain ranges in southern Arizona, most notably in the Santa Ritas, which is where we are right now. And at higher elevations, like where we are right now, it's allopatric with all other tarantula species. It's around this time that these tarantulas are mating, and I wouldn't be overly surprised if later today we found a mature male wandering about. However, I don't believe that this tarantula here is sexually mature. But if I'm being real, even if it was an adult, it would have basically no chance of getting laid. And that's not me trying to be mean. I'm just trying to be realistic. Like, look at its hairdo. I think I'm being completely fair. And even so, a male tarantula doesn't even have access to that scrape she built because there's no external access. And it's this abdomen here that earns them their second name, Madera red rump, not to be confused with the Madrian red rump. And this is something that we find on males as well. I was also hoping to see some black and orange coloration on these tarantulas today, but that's only really possible to see in tarantulas that have molted within the last few weeks or on a mature male. I opened up this side a little bit. She'll find her way under, and if she wants to block it back off, she can do that. As you can tell, it is quite fun to troll these little abatis. This isn't the same one as the one I was just uh, messing around with. This is a smaller one. We also have these black and yellow beetles swimming around in here. And I'm forgetting the name of them, but they are the ones that people like to put in their aquariums as a kind of ornament. Uh, there's another one over here. Now we are looking at some whirly gig beetles. These are actually a little bit predatory. Can see this group over here is honing in on a dead grasshopper.
and those abatis have a larger relative that lives in these pools. This is not a very good example, but... Here's a lithosaurus. People like to call these guys toe biter bugs, and I was actually a victim of this myself when I was a little kid. And it's this proboscis that they have underneath their big eyes that they use to pierce prey, or in some cases, poke skin. You can see that their legs are laterally compressed. This compression developed over time to help these swim around in water. And while the back four legs have little hooks on the tarsi, the front ones are modified just to one point for catching prey. We have a Jerusalem cricket in here, but this one looks kind of screwed up. It's acting very strangely. Ordinarily, I would just blame this on change of the seasons. As we approach winter here, a lot of insects die off, but that isn't what's going on here. And quickly here, before I explain the potential cause of this behavior, I know some people may notice that this insect has an infection, a fungal infection on its leg here, that black spot. That isn't the cause of what's going on here. However, if these infections spread on an arthropod, this can cause severe changes in behavior. What's likely going on here is this Amopelmatis cricket is infected with a parasite. This is a horsehair worm. If you don't know what that looks like, while I was rooting around in a stream, I found a clump of these horsehair worms. These are all adult worms. The adults are free living and reproduce in the water. It's only when these crickets become adults that the parasite really starts to become a problem. Eventually the parasite reaches a size where it takes up basically the entire volume of the abdomen. But since these worms leave their host when the host is dying or just freshly dead, they need to leave the host in an area that's suitable for them as free living adults. And this is where we get into something called fatal attraction. Many parasites will cause change in behavior in the host, such that when the parasite leaves the host, it's in an area that's very favorable for the life cycle to continue. These horsehair worms cannot live outside of a host or water for very long at all. In fact, many will die within just a few minutes. As for horsehair worms specifically, regarding fatal attraction, it's been found that insects that are infected with these horsehair worms have a 15% greater chance of migrating towards the water than the insects that aren't infected. Typically, these crickets, when you find them, in little divots like this. They're all folded up nicely in a dormant position. But this one was scrunched up against the rock already looking kind of bizarre when we flipped that stone. And I think I'm going to leave this one in the grass since I'm definitely just gonna crush it if I put it back. And you can see it still has its biting reflex. Well, I was certainly hoping that we would see one of these. We we're below a nice rock pile here and next to a little ravine. And we are on a north facing slope. So really not a bad place for one of these tarantula burrows to be. And it really isn't all that large, but this should belong to an adult or maybe a subadult. The silk of my gallimorphs, which includes tarantulas, is quite unmistakable. Ah, I just saw a little tarantula dip down a hole. Watch as I try to root around a little bit, see if we can locate it. There it is. Luckily at this time, we're fairly high up the mountain, so even though this one is immature and quite small at that, I do know that this is an Aphonopelma madeira. This species has a slight overlap at a certain elevation range with Aphonopelma vorhesi, which is this tarantula right here. And if I were to be in that overlap area, like I was earlier today, it would be practically impossible to tell which species it is. Even Aphonopelma calcotes can be found in that area, and it isn't from the same clade as the two tarantulas I just mentioned. But at that size, the Arizona blonde tarantula, Aphonopelma calcotes, can also be a bit tricky to tell apart. As it goes with tarantulas in the genus of Phonopelma, I wouldn't be very surprised if this one took a couple decades to mature. Tarantulas in the genus of Phonopelma 
especially the ones at higher elevations, are notorious for having absolutely absurd growth rates. No. Go that way. Go down. Down. I'm sure it'll find its way. Oh, nice. A double flip of scorpions. These are Santa Rita Mountains scorpions, which are endemic to the area that we're in right now. In case you weren't seeing the other ones right here. This scorpion that we have is called Pseudoreoctinus Santa Rita. And of course, it's just named after the mountain range that it is predominantly found in. And it shares a lot of sympatry with the Madeira Canyon tarantula, having many of the same habitat requirements. But these scorpions like to stay in shaded areas closer to moisture. Meanwhile, you'll find that the tarantulas like the more xeric areas. You might be wondering why these two scorpions are different colors. The darker brown one is an adult, and the lighter cream-colored one is a subadult. There's really not that much size difference between these two scorpions, but it is during that last molt that this species undergoes a substantial color transition. And these guys are a little bit of a pain to film. Look how speedy they are. Watch. Very tough to track. It's very easy to get these to stay still, but not to move at any reasonable speed. This of course is true for the adults as well. They just kind of dash around. But it is possible to find these in the winter as well. And when it is colder out, they can be quite sluggish. Unlike these ones right now. Here are our scorpions. I'm just going to place them on the back side of the rock here. And they should be able to find their way back. They're kind of a pain though. They like to stick to you. I guess that works too. You can just shake them off. Right down here we have a patch of relatively inconspicuous dirt. This is just a mound that's been created by a rodent at some point. These are fairly common in these kinds of areas. But this one actually has a trapdoor spider burrow here, and this is its lid. Based on the way that this one is built, it should belong to a wafer lid trapdoor spider, or belonging to the family Eustinizidae. Now, because we're having mild weather, and this one decided to dig into some fairly loose sand, and we still have some sparse precipitation, I am going to dig this one up, and then I'm going to create a hole in the dirt with a stick and it'll have its burrow back to completion and by tomorrow morning. The door is right here. Already you can see that the soil is quite moist, so we won't be giving the spider much trouble in its digging process tonight. When the soil is wet like this, it can be fairly straightforward to follow these burrows. Otherwise, when it is more uh, loose and dry, they can quickly cave in and you can lose them completely. Usually with these trapdoor spiders, the direction the burrow goes after the entrance is typically opposite to the way that the door opens, which means that in this case, our burrow should go that way, more or less, and then it might do all sorts of turns. Just as I had predicted, it goes actually parallel to the surface of the ground. Alright, so actually this burrow was extremely short, only several centimeters, so I don't think we did much harm here. I've located the spider, and I'm going to show you that up close. Here it is. And the spider that we have here is in the genus Aptosticus. This is a genus that has been shown on the channel before, but all the ones previously shown were ones that I had found in California. And the diversity of Aptosticus spiders in California trumps that of Arizona. Arizona only has a few species. Meanwhile, California has over 30. And this individual that we have here is quite small. It's only a juvenile, and it'll get about five times as large as this one. But I only excavated it because I accidentally found its door. But perhaps in the future, I will make a video in which I search for the adults because they are quite impressive. Just placing it over to the side for now. I'm taking all the dirt and pushing it back up on this mound. 
just gonna pack it in a little bit and then just need a stick just creating a start for it and like I said it'll do the rest of the work in the matter of a night or so I will cover them up with a few leaves. Oh, nice. Got our final tarantula here. And this is actually quite peculiar. This is the first male tarantula I've ever flipped in my life. Look at that. Got a little red mite there. Sorry, I don't want to flex on my viewers too much, but I have flipped many dozens of these Aphonopelma tarantulas, not this species in particular, but just in general. And as I've said, I haven't run into any mature males, but I guess it was about time. This one was probably out during the day looking for a date, um, for a mate, rather. Same thing, I guess, though. And by the time that dusk arrived, it decided to go back into hiding. So it might not have been under that rock for very long until we found it. And quite likely it'll repeat that cycle again tomorrow. And as you can tell, the males of the species that reach maturity are not all that large, quite like the females. And this is generally true for all of the tarantulas that live in higher elevations in Arizona. Sun is setting fairly early these days, so I'm going to call it here. That will be all for this video. Thank you for watching.